Have you ever found yourself watching a Disney movie and then thought to yourself, hmm, this all seems familiar somehow? And by familiar, I mean nearly identical? You know, like in the ways that characters dance or get bonked on the head? It's almost like you've seen it before? Well, guess what? You have. What's up everyone, I'm Jacob with Cartoon Hangover, and throughout Disney's history, ever since 1941's Dumbo, Disney has been borrowing from their back catalog of animation. We're here to check out how it all got started, and the real reason they used this method. Cause surely, Walt Disney artists are so good, they would never need to trace, right? Well, they don't need to, but they did. And we're going to find out why. Let's jump right in and take a look at why Disney recycles animation. It was done probably to save time, save money, although I don't think it saved much time and I don't think it saved much money because it was more of a hassle to go dig this old footage out of the archive. It would have been easier just sit down and animate a new scene than to go back and try to retrofit all this old stuff to something new. We're looking back to the 1960s and 70s when people weren't thinking how films would change, how media would change, and how people would be able to look at these various films and compare one film against the other. So so let's start from the very beginning. You see, before the Walt Disney Company made Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, they hadn't yet cracked how to draw realistic characters for animation. Mickey Mouse was great, but he didn't look real. And Disney wanted Snow White and her prince to look real. So how did they do it? By filming real actors and tracing their movements, of course. The animators would draw over the real footage frame by frame, creating a realistic animated movement. This process is called rotoscoping, which is an accepted animation process still used today. So if rotoscoping a film the live action image is acceptable, what about tracing over a pre-existed animated image if you already own the rights to it? Disney's team decided, Sure, why not? No one thought Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs was gonna make any money. How could anyone make a full-length feature animation, right? The movie was dubbed Disney's Folly before its release, and many suspected it would signal the downfall of the Walt Disney Company. Well, to everyone's surprise, when Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs was released in 1937, it was a critical and commercial success, making over $66 million at the box office, which would be almost $685 million today. Walt Disney helped paved the way for what we know now as the animated feature business. And he wanted to take the art form to a new level. Unfortunately, Disney's ambitions caused the next few films to go way over budget. Pinocchio, Fantasia, and Bambi were all considered losses for the studio. Only 1941's Dumbo proved to be a financial success. And then there was that pesky war, which just threw a wrench into everything. Disney's financial shortcomings and the United States' involvement in World War II caused the company to shift focus from animated features to war propaganda. And it's here that the reuse of old animation became rampant. Take the 1947 film Fun and Fancy Free, more a pair of extended shorts rather than a full-length feature, something Disney was doing a lot in the 40s. That movie alone borrows animation from Dumbo, Bambi, Ferdinand the Bull, and Springtime for Pluto. Then there very next film, Melody Time, took a shot from Fun and Fancy Free. Soon after, the live-action animated film, So Dear to My Heart, reused a pair of clouds from Fantasia. The precedent was set. If animators wanted to take from earlier Disney films, they had the right to do so. But why did they do this? Was it money? Time? Laziness? Okay, well it definitely wasn't laziness. These animators all worked insane hours to produce these films on a crazy schedule. So even they thought it was done to save time and money. These movies were made on a deadline and they needed to turn a profit. Not to mention that animated features took a really long time to make, with years between big theatrical releases. So animators didn't really think that audiences would notice the reused animation. You know, since the internet wasn't a thing and they wouldn't really be able to compare these films effectively. And also Walt Disney almost lost the company for being a little too innovative and ambitious. So if sticking to convention is what was keeping the company alive, it was a sacrifice that Walt Disney Animation Studios was willing to make. Although the man himself probably wasn't even aware of this. I don't think he even noticed it. I don't think he thought much about it. I don't think he even noticed it. His mind was always on the on the big picture. His mind was always on the story and not so much the, the little production things that really didn't interest him all that much. According to veteran Disney animator Floyd Norman, Walt may not have even noticed the animation recycling because his mind was always so focused on the big picture. So after the end of World War II, Walt Disney set his sights on three more titans to conquer. Live action features, television, and a 160 acre site near Anaheim which he would turn into a theme park called 
Disneyland. Why bring this up in a video about reused Disney animation? Well, it was around this time that Disney films started thriving again. Gone were the days of cobbling shorts together to make a full-length movie. Though that being said, the films did lack that Walt Disney touch of his first feature animated projects. They were no longer the main focus of the company. The movies became a safe product for a company on the rise. A company less comfortable with taking big risks. As good as Cinderella was, it basically came off as Snow White Part De. Sure, it didn't reuse animation, but it had fairly similar story beats with a focus on a European fairy tale. The Walt Disney Company's follow-up to Cinderella, Alice in Wonderland, did reuse animation, via establishing shots from both Pinocchio and Bambi, and it also had a lot of actor rotoscoping involved. Lady and the Tramp took a shot of chickens from Farmyard Symphony, and then Sleeping Beauty used a menacing shot from the adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad. Nothing too egregious, but enough to see that reusing animation was still a pretty common practice even when the studio was doing well financially. In less than 40 years, the Walt Disney Company had gone from an upstart animation studio creating silent shorts to a thriving entertainment empire. While Walt Disney was off working on something called The Florida Project, which eventually became some niche thing called Disney World? The Disney Animation Studio kept chugging along, churning out both hits and misses. 101 Dalmatians introduced a new style of animation that used the Xerox process to copy animators' drawings directly onto animation cells, cutting out the inking process and saving time and money. That's why Disney movies from the 60s have this rougher, shaggier look than the hand-inked ones that came before. During that time, reusing animation became even more commonplace. 101 Dalmatians took shots from Cinderella and Peter Pan. The Sword in the Stone went absolutely nuts with the practice, using shots from Bambi, Goliath 2, 101 Dalmatians, Sleeping Beauty, The Truth About Mother Goose, and The Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad, the same shot that was reused a few years earlier in Sleeping Beauty. The Jungle Book also heavily used this method and took a ton of shots from other films. From 101 Dalmatians, the film copied the way the puppies walked and implemented those motions into Mowgli's wolf siblings when they were pups. It took the way the dogs jump up to greet Arthur in the Sword in the Stone, and made Mowgli's wolf siblings greet him in the exact same way. The deer you briefly see in the Jungle Book is directly copied from Bambi. Not to mention, there were also shots taken from The Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad and Goliath 2. Of course, even the original shots from the Jungle Book were later traced over for Robin Hood, particularly the dance scene between Baloo and King Louie, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Throughout this period, Walt Disney was in failing health and he was often off working on his own pet projects, like Mary Poppins or his Community of the Future, which became Epcot. The Jungle Book would be the last full-length animated feature that Disney would have any direct involvement with. He passed away in 1966, a year before its release. Following the passing of Walt Disney, the practice of reusing animation continued throughout the 60s, 70s, and 80s. The Aristocats took a couple of shots from 101 Dalmatians. Robin Hood borrowed the character design for Little John from The Jungle Book's Baloo, also recycling a lot of Baloo's animation. For a musical sequence, it lifted moments directly from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs and The Aristocats, and it also recycled the scene from Alice in Wonderland. The Rescuers followed, taking scenes from The Jungle Book and, in addition, backgrounds from previous properties. The Fox and the Hound took some animal inspiration from Bambi and the Sword in the Stone, and the Black Cauldron lifted some spooky elements from Fantasia and the Sword in the Stone. During this era of the Disney Company, a lot of this can be traced back to a single animator, Wooly Reitherman. We spoke to Floyd Norman, who explained the whole thing. A lot of time reworking this old material was almost more trouble than it was worth. First of all, you had to go dig it out, you had to find it, and then you had to see, well, how can I adapt it? How can I reuse it? Which meant a lot of redrawing, a lot of moving stuff around to make it work. It would have been far more effective, at least in my opinion, to just animate it from scratch. Norman explained that the process didn't actually save much time or money, because the animators would spend a long time digging through the morgue, that's what they called the archive of old sketches and animation, which could have otherwise been spent animating something entirely new. So why do it at all then? Well, it all came down to the choice of director. Reitherman is definitely not the only Disney director who had his animators practice this, but he is the one who's best known for it. The way he saw it, there wasn't really a need to reinvent the wheel if there was already a similar shot that could have been used. Not 
Not a lot of animators loved reusing footage though because it was still really complicated to recreate something new out of something old. Many of them didn't even directly rotoscope. Instead, they would use pencil drawings from the morgue as a guide for these new characters. So with Walt Disney gone, there was no figurehead to tell animators to take big risks or to create something new. They played it safe, and more often than not, regardless of how good they are, the movies still showcase this mentality. In the late 80s, the animation department at Disney was in shambles. They'd had a string of flops, and Disney was making money from its film subsidiaries, its theme parks, and its merchandise. No one seemed to really care about feature animation anymore. But following numerous films getting greenlit for production to compete with Don Bluth's uprising company, things started to turn around. The movies got better, and people started seeing them again. The Great Mouse Detective was all new animation, but the Rescuers Down Under actually borrowed a flying sequence from The Rescuers, though it felt more like an homage than an outright recycling. Beauty and the Beast rotoscoped a shot of Bambi's mom. This is a shot that got reused a lot, by the way. We already mentioned it once in the Jungle Book. And the final ballroom dance is from Sleeping Beauty, but again, this time it was to honor the films that paved the way for their creation. As Disney movies were improving and becoming innovative again, the VHS market and home video culture was on the rise. It became a lot harder to recycle animation as people saw these movies more often. When people were finally able to watch and re-watch Disney movie after Disney movie, it became much easier to notice things that were well, the same. Not to mention that a little later on, side-by-side -side comparisons on YouTube really helped spread awareness. Fortunately, as we already mentioned, Disney animation didn't really need to continue reusing shots. Sure, Pocahontas reused a shot of leaves blowing from The Lion King, and The Princess and the Frog used a shot from The Sword and the Stone, but that's pretty much it. Recycling animation was a practice of the past. Or was it? After Princess and the Frog, Disney announced that the days of 2D animation were coming to an end. And ever since Tangled, all of Disney's animated films have been computer animated. This process meant utilizing new skills present in the animation industry, which wasn't too hard thanks to the company's affiliation with Pixar. Still, it was a process that involved learning how to model characters, create props and scenery, and add textures to an animated world. In a CG animated film, each character needs to be shaped from scratch before being animated. The same character model is used in multiple shots, if not the whole movie. Unlike how in 2D films, each drawing is a different physical iteration of that character. This character model, along with everything else that you see in the film, is an asset. And they can be inserted into any scene or movie. That's how they dropped the Rapunzel cameo into Frozen. They literally dropped her 3D model into the film. Similarly, animators reuse character models for sequels all the time, like in the Toy Story franchise. It's hard to catch recycled 3D assets in an animated feature because it's a format that's so much more customizable. Everything is an individual piece, from the cars in Zootopia to the palm trees in Moana. These elements can travel from film to film, but be reskinned with a new color, a new texture, or even a physical tweak. In fact, there was a time where people thought that the sisterly duo from Frozen was actually just modified from Rapunzel's model, but Disney denied these claims. But think about it, why recreate a model for, say, a table, when you've already made 10 various ones in the past? The reason CGI is so expensive and time-consuming right now is because not enough assets have been made. So if a model is available for a 3D animator to use, they'll save a lot of time and money in reusing it. And chances are you won't even notice these recycled assets because they are film chameleons. Unless it's the Pizza Planet truck. Because Disney is so popular, it tends to be the studio that gets knocked the most for reusing animation, but it is by far not the only company that did or does this. It's a practice that often pops up in anime as well. Even Hanna-Barbera has been known to recycle animation. Ever notice how the gang in Scooby-Doo seems to run away from ghouls the exact same way every time? It's also not just animation that borrows shots. Blade Runner's theatrical release recycled shots that were originally filmed for the opening scene of The Shining. The in-space explosion in Star Trek Generations can also be seen in the Star Trek film The Undiscovered Country. And we can't not mention the Wilhelm scream. <laughs> which can be found in numerous other films. From its original source in the 1951 film Distant Drums, ah! all the way to 2015 Star Wars The Force Awakens. Ah! Seems like reusing elements in film and television is just the nature of the industry. So the next time you watch a Disney movie, look a little closer. You may find that you've seen parts of it more times than you thought. Once again, I'm Jacob with Cartoon Hangover, and thanks for checking out Why Disney Recycles Animation. Which ones have you noticed in the past? Did we miss any? Comment below and let us know. Don't forget to click the little bell icon to become part of our notification squad, and of course, if you like what you just saw, be sure to subscribe to the channel. And thank you for sharing your Cartoon Hangover with us.